Okay, so uh, what I'll tell you today about is really what we know about the, the early universe and what, we will, what we're hoping to learn about it in the next uh, decade or so. And um, let me start by just saying that it may not always seem that way, but the universe we live in is actually remarkably simple. And it turns out that the evolution of the universe is uh, described by just a handful of parameters, and we've measured most of those parameters to within a few percent. And maybe this sounds surprising to you or sounds like a strong claim, and so uh, part of the goal of the talk today is to try to explain how, given that if you look at the night sky and you only see a few faint dots in the, in the night sky, we can actually learn so much about the, the early universe and talk about it with some confidence. This is really a recent or relatively recent development, and so I'll, I'll try to really take you through uh, some of the, the steps that uh, led us to, to this conclusion, and then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what else we've learned in a more uh, qualitative uh, way. But So if you look at the night sky, this is not really uh, what you would see of the night sky. This is already showing a lot more stars. If you look outside, you see a few bright dots, so how do we uh, learn anything from them? And the basic uh, feature that really helps us learn about the early universe is that as you look out into the, uh, into the universe, you're actually also looking back in time because the uh, uh, light travels at a, uh, at a finite speed. And so uh, we can use this. So as an example, if you imagine that you are a, um, uh, an astronaut on the moon and you look at the Earth, you don't really see the Earth as it is now. You see the Earth as it is about 1.3 seconds ago. That's not all that much. Not that much changes in 1.3 seconds, but still 1.3 seconds uh, uh, elapse from the time the, the light here is reflected and uh, when you see it. And the way we know it is because we know the, the speed of light from just lab measurements, and we know the distance to the moon uh, there's various ways we know it. One of the ways is just that uh, astronauts left a big mirror there, and we can actually use that mirror to uh, bounce laser uh, beams between uh, the, the ground and the moon, and so we actually know the distance to within a few millimeters, and so we know how long light takes to, to travel from the, the moon to the astronaut on the moon, uh, from, the sun, from the Earth to the astronaut on the moon. If you look at the sun, it gets a little bit more interesting, uh, you don't really see, if you look at the sun, obviously you should use uh, shades, you just shouldn't just look at the sun, but if you look at the sun with proper equipment, you don't see the sun uh, the way it is now, but you see it uh, the way it was eight minutes ago. So if you see a solar flare, that flare is not happening now, it happened eight minutes ago. And that's, uh, again, something we know because we know the size of the, the solar system uh, originally from Venus transits, now we have a lot of uh, space probes that allow us to measure the size of the solar system with great accuracy, so we know how long light uh, travels uh, between us and the sun, and so we look back eight minutes in, in this case. Um, that doesn't teach us anything about the early universe, so we'll have to try to figure out how we uh, look further out. Here I'm showing you an example of uh, 61 Cygni, which is a, a binary star in the constellation Cygnus, which some of you may recognize is down here. So that's the, the swan that's flying along the, the Milky Way. You see the, the wings here and here in the back of uh, the right wing. This is the uh, 61 Cygni, and it turns out if you look at that binary system, you don't really see it as it is now, but as it was 11, uh, roughly 11 or 11.4 years ago. And now you might ask, well, how do you know this one? Because I, I knew how far it is to the sun, I knew how far it is to the moon. Here it's a little bit less clear how we actually know this. And the way we know the, the distance to this star is by something that's called uh, a parallax. So that's a, a basic way of measuring distances. And your brain, in fact, is using this uh, at all times to, to infer how far an object is from you in a room or what's further away, what's closer in a, in a room. If you want to do it, not subconsciously, but you want to do it actively, you should look at objects with one eye closed and then with the other eye closed. You can do it with your finger because you can easily change the position and you see that if you look at it with one eye and then with the other eye, the, the object appears to move. The object doesn't really uh, move, it just appears to move and it appears to move more the closer it is to you. So the further away the object is, the less it appears to move. Now, you'll see that relatively quickly you run out of uh, eyesight to really 
measure the distance to objects in this way. So what we do is not really uh, exactly this, but we use essentially the same idea where we observe stars in the night sky, let's say in the fall, and measure the position of that star, typically relative to stars that are much further away. And then we look at the same star in the, in the spring, half a year away, and you see that the star, so this is essentially your right eye, this is your left eye if you want, and so the star appears to have moved by some angle pi, which is called the, the parallax, and this angle, uh, together with the, the size of the solar system, which we said we know, allows you to measure how far the, the star is away from us. So this is how we measure distances to, to nearby stars, and it's easy to see if you draw, do the same exercise with a star that's closer that the angle then gets bigger. So we have some way of just measuring this angle, knowing the size of the solar system, to work out how far away stars are, uh, are from us. And again, this is something, so this is something that we've done now, or the Gaia mission is doing this for a billion stars within our galaxy, so it's very impressive, but it's still limited in the sense that it doesn't really allow us to look far beyond our own galaxy, and so we need other techniques to really measure distances to objects that are further away than stars in our own galaxy. And here, what one of the ways uh, we have been doing this is by using an observation by Henrietta Swan Levitt from quite a while ago, so I'm showing you her data here. What she was doing is she was observing variable stars in the large Magellanic cloud. Variable just means that they get a little brighter, then they get a little dimmer, so the, uh, the brightness changes as a function of time in a periodic way. And then here you just, so I'm showing just some of the table. I mean, she observed a lot of them. Here is just a, a small subset. You see that she carefully numbered the, the various stars, and then she recorded how bright they are. So the units uh, astronomers use are funny in the sense that smaller numbers means that they're brighter. But so here you see 13.6 for this one. It gets a little dimmer to 14.7, to so she recorded the magnitudes, the ranges. And then if you look at these numbers and look at the periods, so she also measured the periods for these stars, then you see that there's a, a relation. So here, this one has a period of 10 days and uh, a magnitude of about 13.6 uh, here. If you look for another one that has a similar period, let's say this one, it has a similar magnitude, whereas the, the much bigger one has, uh, is brighter. So there's a correlation between the periods of these stars and the, the magnitudes. And this is, uh, so this is something that she pointed out in this paper, and here's a, a graph, not from the same paper, but another, another paper, where you see that there's really a good correlation between the, the period of these objects and their magnitudes. And so this allows you to now look for these types of stars in other galaxies, not in the large Magellanic cloud, but in other galaxies. All you have to measure is really the period, and then uh, you know how bright uh, that object should be if it were in the large Magellanic cloud. From measuring the magnitude that you see, you can then infer how much further or closer the other galaxy is to us than the large Magellanic cloud. So what you're left with is do you have to measure this, uh, the distance to these objects, let's say with, uh, with parallax, uh, and then you have an absolute way of measuring distances by, by using uh, these stars. So that's uh, the, the way we can, one way we can measure distances to distant galaxies, not too distant. If we want to go even further away, we need brighter objects. I won't really talk about them because they're not too relevant for my talk, but you can use supernova uh, data to look even further out. I'll just show one, uh, one graph with that. So we can measure the distance in this way. Something else, if we're trying to learn about whether the universe ex is expanding, contracting, is that we somehow have to understand how we would measure the velocities of these objects. So are they moving toward us? Are they moving away from us? And this is done usually by measuring the, the spectrum of these objects. So here is an illustration uh, that shows how this is done. So you have a star. You take the starlight uh, through a, a prism and then it uh, breaks it up into the different wavelengths. So here you see the, the spectrum of the star. You see it goes from, I mean, usually the colors of the rainbow. It's the same, same kind of physics. Um, and then you can measure how bright it is the, as a function of here frequency. And what you also see is that there are some characteristic lines. So the lines here for the sun are called the Fraunhofer lines because Fraunhofer carefully mapped uh, the, the lines. And so these features we can use to determine whether a star is moving toward us or away from us. So let's see how that works. So if we have a star 
that's addressed with respect to us and say, it uh, looks this way. So there's a, a few lines at a, a characteristic, uh, characteristic frequency. And now you have a star that's moving away from us. Then the claim is that the lines for that star will be slightly shifted to the red by an amount that's usually written in this way as 1 plus z. And this uh, quantity z is called the redshift. So you see if it's positive, the wavelength that you observe for the star is longer than the wavelength that you would observe if the star was at rest. And so now you might ask, why are these, uh, why are these lines moving? Why are the frequency? Why is it changing? And the, the idea is quite similar to something that you're familiar with from sound. So if you look at a, or listen to a car that's approaching, and then you listen to it when it's moving away from you, you, you know that there's a difference in the pitch for that car, if you're not. Either the horn, or you can also just hear the engine. I mean, it doesn't have to honk the horn necessarily, but you can also do it with the horn or the, the siren. But so the idea is you have a higher pitch as it's approaching, and then a lower pitch as it's moving away from you. And so this is uh, what allows you to measure the, the velocity of these objects. That's the, the basic idea. And uh, you can. Um, Go back, and this is uh, Vesto Melvin Slifer was doing these measurements early on. That's not really the first uh, paper, but this is some, some paper by him where he's measuring redshifts of galaxies. So I was showing you stars. There's also features in the spectrum of galaxies, so you can try to measure uh, how far galaxies are. Or in this case, people weren't yet sure, so they were called nebulae. Uh, and you see that most of them are moving away from us. There's just a few nearby things, uh, it turns out, that are, are moving uh, toward us. At the time, he didn't know the distance. He just knew the velocities. But so there's a way we can measure both the distances to these objects and the velocities. This is what uh, Hubble did, uh, basically by combining the two techniques I was mentioning. And then the diagram he found was that there's essentially a linear relation, or at least he fit a linear, uh, just a, a linear function to the, to the data. Uh, you might argue maybe this data, you could also fit something else to it, but <laughs> let's assume that what you should be fitting is a, a straight line. I'll show you the up-to-date uh, Hubble diagrams. Um, but so here is the, the distance, and here is the velocity of the redshift, and you see that there's a linear relation between the two, and this is, what uh, we usually think as the, the proof that the universe is expanding. So it's maybe not obvious from the plot, so I want to just give you uh, a, a simple version of uh, how you want to think about it or how you understand that there should be a linear relation between velocity and distance in an expanding universe. And it's difficult to really um, illustrate in our 3 plus 1 dimensional universe. So let's imagine that we live in a lower dimensional universe. You could imagine the surface of a balloon, or because even that was too hard for me to draw properly, let's just imagine that we live on a circle. And then the red galaxy might be the galaxy we live in. The orange galaxy is some other galaxy. And then the blue galaxy is yet some other galaxy. And this is the initial time. This is the size of the universe is indicated by the, the radius here of this um, of the circle, and then as time goes on, the, if the universe grows at some later time, it looks like this, let's say, uh, I don't know, 100,000 years later or some, some time scale later, it looks like this, and you see that the, the orange point uh, moved by a, some distance away, the blue point moved by twice that distance away, and because this happened in, at the same time, the velocities for these two things are or the velocity for the, the blue galaxy relative to the red galaxy is twice <laughs> as large as for the orange galaxy. And the distance is also twice the, the distance from the orange galaxy. So you see that there's uh, a linear relationship between the two. You can keep going. You get a picture that looks like this as the universe is expanding out. So I'm showing you snapshots at some, some different times. And then uh, in, if you want to write it in terms of uh, uh, equations, you can say that the distance, let's say, between the red and the orange galaxy is given by the size of the radius times the, the angle between, at least if the angle is small. And similarly, because the only thing that's changing is the, the velocity, uh, the, the radius, then the velocity is just given by the time derivative of the radius times the, the angle. And if you combine them, you see that there's this linear relation where uh, the constant of proportionality 
is the fractional rate of change of the size of the, the universe at that time. And because Hubble made these measurements, this is usually called H and uh, called the, the Hubble constant. So one of the pieces, uh, the way I'm presenting it now, is that we can uh, use the data to learn that the universe is expanding, but we can also turn the equation around. And this gives us now a new way of actually inferring distances to, to these objects, because all we have to measure now for objects that are very far away, where the uh, recession velocities here are large compared to their uh, intrinsic motion, we can use this formula to measure the distance if we know the velocity which we can get from the spectra. So that's uh, a way we can measure the distance from measuring the redshifts. Let's see if there's any questions. Yeah. Uh, we had a question about whether or not the laser pointer can be a different color. <laughs> the laser it's kind of blinding. It's really blind. I, I don't have another one, so this is the no one worries. that's here. I don't know. <laughs> Can you adjust the intensity? No, not really. <laughs> it's a 19th century laser. <laughs> yeah, so I have a red one or no? no. <clears throat> Any other other questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which uh, Hubble constant do you use since there's two, yes, so there's two values for it? <laughs> so for what I'm saying now, for this coarse-grained view, um, it doesn't really... So if you go back in history, there was a debate whether the Hubble constant is 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec or 50. Now we're significantly better than that, and we're debating whether it's 72 or 68. And so these kind of changes <laughs> won't really make a difference for what I'm saying. Uh, I gave a talk on Friday, a detailed talk about exactly the current uh, Hubble measurements. So in principle, I can tell you a lot more about how the different measurements are done and what the subtleties are with the different measurements. But for what I'm saying, really, it doesn't matter. You can think of it as some democratic uh, middle of 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. person. Yeah? And it's still linear. It's still linear. It so eventually, the, you have to be careful in, uh, as you go further out, eventually you have to be careful uh, about this. So eventually the relationship changes both the, the distances, you have to be more careful in general relativity it's, how you define it's them. It's accelerating, isn't it? So it isn't quite linear. The expansion is accelerating, so it isn't quite linear. So uh, as I'm saying, so if you go further out, so this is only nearby. If you go further out, you have to be more careful both about what you, what you mean by the distance or how you, how you define the distance and about uh, this relation. So there's a, a generalization that I didn't write on the slides, but there's a version of this formula that's, that holds in general relativity and that takes that into account. What, what distance does that change? At what distance well, so here, here I'm assuming that this uh, redshift is small compared to one. So that's uh, the expansion parameter. Sorry? You mean this? The redshift, the Z, Z quantity, is I'm assuming is small compared to one, which also means that the recession velocity should still be small compared to the speed of light. So that's the, uh, the expansion parameter. As soon as these objects... Uh, recede from us at a, a speed that's comparable, larger than the speed of light, then this formula is no longer true. Just saying that you have to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I can write down the full formula if people are interested. <laughs> Um, let's suppose uh, red is the Earth or the Sun, and uh, yellow and blue are two other stars. Yeah. The relative velocity, their h h naught d, uh, is the velocity you would have if those stars had no separate motion of their own, but they were kind of at rest, and the space between them just yes, expanded. Yes, that's what I'm assuming here. So here I'm assuming that I'm really... But they could also have their own individual velocity. In general, they will have their own individual velocity, and this is also something that will modify this relation. So this eventually, so there's a, a typical velocity associated with the intrinsic motion of these objects, let's say a few hundred kilometers per second. So you don't want the redshift to be too large because otherwise this formula doesn't apply anymore, and you also don't want it to be too small because otherwise exactly this effect becomes important. So you have to be in just the right regime for this formula that I'm writing to hold. In principle, you can incorporate 
the motion. This is something that people do, and you can also generalize it so it holds for larger distances and larger distances. Another one, you know, so that would change its velocity a lot. Well, yeah, the star is orbiting another one. The, the <laughs> star can be orbiting something else, so it's coming at you or going away. So here, I'm really imagining that I'm looking at uh, galaxies yeah. as a whole. Oh. So these are further out. So oh. I'm not so worried so about the orbit. individual <laughs> stars. So <you'd, laughs> the galaxies might themselves also orbit, but yeah, there's okay. also a typical yeah. few hundred kilometers per second yeah. velocities associated with that. So you want to be, as I said, larger. Uh, so that's the. So again, remember that the, the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. So this would correspond, if I'm saying the typical velocities here, uh, 300 kilometers per second, then this is a redshift of 10 to the minus 3. So not a, another redshift. Uh, <laughs> is this a redshift? Right? Uh-oh. Yeah. No, this doesn't work anymore, probably. Really? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> Stick, yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, so the, the redshift, as I said, should be larger than 10 to the minus 3, let's say, 10 to the minus 2 if you want to be safe, and less than 1 for this formula to hold. But in principle, you can correct it in, in both uh, directions. Any other questions about this? Okay, so then uh, the only other thing I wanted to do in this context is to just show what the current state of the art for the Hubble diagram looks like. So this is what the, uh, a modern Hubble diagram would look like. And then here it's cut off at 10 to the minus 2 because of the effect we just discussed. So eventually the velocities are larger than the recession velocity, so you don't want to look at it here. There's going to be scatter in that relation. And then here on... Uh, large redshifts, it's not really showing the formula I showed, but this is why it's showing here the, what is called the, the distance modulus, which is really the luminosity distance, which has additional, um, it's a somewhat different thing from just the, the velocity is corrected by, uh, by the redshift, uh, for example, and has cosmo dependence on the, the cosmology. But so this is current state of the art of the, the Hubble diagram measured from supernovae, which I briefly mentioned, but won't really uh, describe in detail. So this is the kind of diagram that uh, makes us pretty sure that the universe actually is expanding, because you wouldn't get this kind of feature. Hubble's data, I mean, some of the galaxies he was looking at really were very nearby, where you have to exactly worry about the intrinsic motion of these objects. But here we really can look at uh, objects that where we really can trust uh, that they're moving uh, fast, fast enough. You can still try to correct. So some of the scatter is, is due to this effect. So you can still try to correct for that in principle and reduce the, the scatter, but this is what it looks like if you just plot it. Okay, so um, here I wanted to just show you what the, if, how far we can actually look out into the universe in, in this way, if you wish. And so here I'm showing you the, the distance record holder, which is, has a not too memorable name. It's GNZ11. Uh, the... Uh, actually stands for Goods North, and then Z11 is telling you that the redshift of the object is about 11, so it has some, some meaning to the name. It tells you where it is and what its redshift is. You can ask what, how far are you looking in, in time to, to that object, and you're seeing that as it was 13.4 billion years ago, or at a time when the universe was 400 million years old. So now you're really looking back in time, and in case you want to find it on the night sky, I put a little animation in it, so you can see the Big Dipper here. Uh, and then uh, I think everyone can find the, the Big Dipper in the night sky. And then eventually we'll zoom in just north of it into the Goods North field, and we'll show you the, the object. So, you <laughs> so now it's harder to... Uh, but, so this is the field, and then uh, this is uh, Hubble data. Oh, wow. <laughs> And so this is the, the galaxy wow. at Redshift 11. So uh, you see this galaxy as it was 13.4 billion years ago. So in this case, you're really looking pretty far back in time. <laughs> so now that we know that the universe is, uh, is expanding, uh, 
we also know that at early times it was significantly denser and, and hotter. And you could ask if there should be, so eventually there are, weren't yet any galaxies, but you can ask if there's any radiation left over from this hotter period. And this is exactly the question that uh, Dickey was asking and got uh, Peebles, Roll, and Wilkinson to work on it. So here they're shown on the uh, roof of the, the Princeton physics department trying to see if they can find any radiation that's left over from a hotter period of the universe. And meanwhile, not too far away from it, so this I should say is only really showing Roland Wilkinson. Jim Peebles, you might know, received the Nobel Prize recently and then Dickey isn't shown in the, in the picture. Uh, meanwhile, not too far away, just 30 miles away in Holmdale, New Jersey, Penzias and Wilson were not really looking for that signal, but were looking uh, or using a, a telescope um, to initially with the hope to, to study our galaxy. And they had the problem that they just had noise in the instrument that they couldn't explain. It was there everywhere they were looking in the sky. They thought maybe it's, it's pigeons. They cleaned out the, <laughs> the instrument. It, it still didn't really... Um, go away, so they were seeing the signal and just couldn't understand what was going on. So for them, it was just some excess noise in their antenna. And eventually, uh, Jim Peebles gave a talk that um, Ken Turner heard, told Bernie Berg, who told Penzias and Wilson that there's a group at Princeton uh, trying to detect a signal from the early universe that looks essentially like what they were looking at. And so then there were the, the two papers published back to back by Penzias and Wilson about the measurement of excess antenna temperature, so just noise they couldn't explain, and the interpretation of the signal uh, as cosmic black body radiation by Dickey, Peebles, Roll, and uh, Wilkinson. And uh, now that you made the, the claim that this is really cosmic black body radiation, radiation that's left over from the hot early universe, uh, you have to somehow uh, understand uh, how this works. Before then, I wanted to just, as a, a fun fact, if you look at the telescope, you might ask, why was there this telescope around in, in Holmdale, New Jersey? <laughs> and I don't know if anyone, has anyone heard of the Project ECHO by, by NASA? So some yeah. people, I guess, know about well, it. we remember it. Yeah, I, okay. We <laughs> Sorry? We saw it in space. Sure. Okay, the balloons, yeah. So this is what the, this telescope was initially used for. So the Holmdel telescope was used to receive the signals that were sent from, from JPL. So this is what the, the telescope was used for initially. Okay, so now one is trying to understand whether the signal you're seeing really is from the early universe or really is just some, some noise that you don't understand. So it makes additional predictions that you can try to look for. For example, because the Earth moves around the sun, the uh, sun, the solar system moves in our galaxy, our galaxy moves, it's pretty unlikely that we're at rest with respect to this radiation. And then you expect that the radiation should look a little bit hotter in the direction you're moving and a little bit colder in the direction you're moving away from. A little bit like when you're running in the rain, more drops hit you from the front than from the back. So this kind of effect is what people were looking for very early on. And I'm showing usually the measurement that I'm showing on the next slide is credited with the detection of the, the dipole. Here I'm showing a measurement uh, that I really like that m detected the, uh, the dipole measured the right ascension, declination, and amplitude. Uh, this is a measurement by just a single person, which is pretty remarkable given what the experiments uh, look <laughs> like now. And so Paul Henry built the instrument, launched the balloon, collected the data, did all the analysis by himself, wrote a single author paper on it. And the fun thing to me is that he was a grad student at the time. So. <laughs> And so, as I said, the, the dipole we think of as associated with the motion uh, relative to the cosmic microwave background. And so this measurement tells us uh, the, the speed with which we're moving relative to the cosmic microwave background. Uh, once you know the, the temperature, which I'll show in a second, you can really convert it into, into a velocity. So we, um, this is the measurement that's usually credited. This is a, a detection at much higher significance. <laughs> by uh, Smoot, who used the same detectors that then flew on a satellite that I'll, I'll show in a second. But this is the much higher 
uh, confidence detection of the, the dipole of the cosmic microwave background that tells you that we're moving with respect to it and tells you we're moving with respect to it roughly at 300 kilometers per second. Um, an additional prediction, just like we had a very characteristic spectrum for starlight, is that the cosmic microwave background should have a very characteristic spectrum, and we usually call it a black body spectrum. So this is what, uh, what's shown here. The black line is the theory curve, and the squares are the data. And so you see that the, the data and the measurement really agree extremely well. So this is a, a beautiful measurement of the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, and so both the frequency spectrum and the motion uh, were detected, and so at that point, Presumably, you're more convinced that what we're looking at is really cosmic uh, black body radiation. Um, going forward, I'll show you a lot of maps of the cosmic microwave background. And so I briefly just wanted to show you how they're usually presented or what it would look like to look at the Earth in this projection. It's called the Molvide projection. And uh, this is just a simple, convenient projection, not unique in any way, but one projection that you can use to map a sphere into uh, the plane. Uh, sometimes when people see it, they, they think it only really shows half of the sphere, but it really shows the, the full sphere. That's why I'm showing you the, the map of the Earth. This is what the Earth would look like in this projection. And we use the same to show the measurements of the cosmic microwave background. Here's what the COBE uh, satellite measured. This was in the early 90s. And the leading piece is quite boring. So this is the black body radiation that we saw. It peaks or it has a temperature of 2.728 Kelvin is what's, uh, what's here. And then in the orange one, it's probably hard for you to see, but there's a small little departure so you can barely see the dipole. So once you remove the 2.728 Kelvin, what you're left with is this map. And this has a, a dipole pattern. So we see that the radiation looks just a little bit hotter in this direction than in this direction by 3.353 uh, millikelvin, in this case consistent with a 3.2 millikelvin, if you remember from the measurement by Paul Henry. So this is the, the dipole caused by our motion relative to the cosmic microwave background. If you subtract off the dipole, uh, assuming that it is from the motion, the image that you're left with is this one. And then if you look here, the most noticeable thing is the red part. This is what we usually see as the Milky Way. So this is just our galaxy. And that's the thing that we usually don't want to see when we're doing cosmology, but that's just a prominent feature in the maps. But if you look at high latitudes, you actually do see fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. These fluctuations we expect to be there because eventually, if the universe were completely homogeneous, we also wouldn't be around. So there have to be small fluctuations. These are the fluctuations. And uh, if you take, so Kobe had three frequency channels, you can use them to try to minimize the emission from the galaxy, and you can make a map of the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. This is what the map looked like at the time, and this is a somewhat noisy and low resolution picture, but it is a picture of what the universe looked like when it was 380,000 years old. So you're looking back basically uh, 13 billion years, and this is what the, the universe looked like at the time. So we can really take a picture because it takes light, uh, tra light travels at a finite speed, and so it takes a long time for the light that was emitted then to reach us. Can you go back? Yeah. So can you give us a sense of the, how much it's actually varying in relative to the actual temperature? Uh, yeah, so here I had it on the previous, yeah, it was 18 microkelvin for the 53 gigahertz map was the scale that was, that was shown here. So it's typically one part in 10 to the 5 or one part in 100,000. So the fluctuations are very small. So it's, yeah, it's kind of blur, fuzzy, it's, it's here. But it's, so it's one part in 10 to the 5 are the intrinsic fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background that have been uh, studied since then. And so there uh, have been a number of uh, measurements since then, experiments since then, that measure the cosmic microwave background. One was uh, Milky, uh, the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe. Uh, Wilkinson is the Wilkinson we saw <coughs> earlier on the roof of the physics department in Princeton. And so here you see the satellite, and it's supposed to illustrate where it's located. So it was uh, located or taking the measurement at the second Lagrange point, which means it's behind the Earth and moving around the solar system with the Earth as it's, as it's taking its data. So this is 
the, the picture, and this is the map that WMAP produced, and you see it's higher resolution, lower noise image of what the universe looked like at 380,000 years old. Uh, the most recent full sky measurement is by the Planck collaboration, which was a European um, experiment by the European Space Agency with contributions by, by NASA and the US. And this is the, the map that we got from Planck. Uh, everyone used slightly different color codes, but it's <laughs> eventually uh, the same, same kind of thing, just shown in different color codes. And this is our current and essentially the final picture of the universe at 380,000 years old because the fluctuations we know are really damped on, on, smaller, on smaller scale. So if you measure it more precisely in intensity, you wouldn't do much better than this. So the picture to your eye would still look the same. Uh, the situation is different in polarization, as I'll mention. So there's more to measure there. So are those structures or are those just random patterns? So they are, to a good approximation, just, I mean, they're, as far as we know, they're consistent. The underlying density field is consistent with just random Gaussian fluctu uh, fluctuations. And what you're seeing, I'll say a little bit more, but what you're seeing are essentially the density perturbations in the medium at the time. So the, the universe was hot and dense at that time. So there were electrons, protons interacting. And that medium was slightly over dense in some parts, slightly under dense. Here, this image is essentially an image. Uh, there's a little bit more physics to it, but essentially an image of the energy density in the in the photons. I mean, there's like this big orange swath. Is that a structure, or is that just random chance? This is random chance is the the claim. So if it, if you run simulations, I didn't include any simulations, but if you generate simulations, you also get structures. Obviously, not in the same place in other parts. It it looks like looks like this. So it doesn't uh, obviously look like there's some some structures there. Excuse me. Is the 380,000 years that you keep showing yeah. is that some a limitation on Hubble? Uh, due to some uh, uh, artifact in the Hubble design, or what? Uh, so, for example, you pointed out that there was close to 14 billion years yeah. before the star. Is that limited by Hubble design, or is there something else there? So, the the star eventually, as you try to look further, there aren't really any any stars yet, so you wouldn't see anything. If you go to to higher redshift, there's some hope that you can see that period through emission from neutral hydrogen, because the universe is neutral at that time. So you can hope to learn something from 21 centimeter line observations. But as you go back, eventually at high enough redshifts, the universe just becomes ionized. And you can't, so photons last scatter around that time. You can't really see through. So we can't really look further back, because the universe is ionized. And the mean free path for photons becomes very small in the early universe. So this is the furthest. This is the 380,000 years. That's at 380. So yeah, I mean, well, before that, you can't see. Before that, you can't really see. So there's hope to directly image something from, uh, <coughs> from earlier times, not in electromagnetic uh, radiation, but for example, gravitational waves, you would be able to see further back in time. Or also, if you could detect the cosmic neutrino background, which we also think is there, you should also be able to look further back in time. But with uh, electromagnetic radiation, you can't really hope to see further back than, than this, just because the medium is ionized and the mean free path uh, is very low. It's like, a, like, I mean, a cloud, you also eventually, if you have a cloud in the sky, you can't look beyond that. It's not a perfect Can you analogy. Tell us how, how, how large this is? Is it the speed of light at 380,000? So the size of the dots, I'll say more about that in a, in a second, but the size of the dots is set essentially not quite by the speed of light, but the speed of sound in the hot early universe. So the universe was filled with electrons, protons, they interact with, other, with each other electromagnetically. The speed of sound is one over the square root of three to good approximation times the speed of light. But it's essentially the, so the size of these objects, the physical size, is the, the speed of sound in the medium, which is about 1 over the square root of 3 of this, the speed of light, times the age of the universe. It's not entirely true. There are some corrections to these formulas. How think, wide is the whole thing? Then? The whole thing is the full sky. So really imagine you make a map of the, the full sky. And so the, 
uh, we know what the physical size is. I can say more about that. But we know what the physical size of one of these blobs should be. And this tells you how far away this surface is. So from that, we can measure essentially the age of the universe, the, the curvature of the universe, because we know how big these blobs are in, in physical size. And that, together with the angular size we measure, allows us to learn something about the distance or the light travel time. So that's one of the main ways. I mean, the characteristic size here that I'll show you more visually is one of the main ways we can actually learn something about uh, the distance to, to this. Any other questions? <coughs> OK, so we can't really hope to predict this map as it is, because there are these red blobs here, and no one can hope to have a theory that predicts why there's a red blob over there, and there isn't a red blob over there. <laughs> so the only thing we can hope to predict are really statistical properties of, of these maps. And so what we do is we look at the angular power spectrum, and I'll try to give you some intuitive feeling for what it is we're actually doing when we're showing the angular power spectrum, which I'll show you in a second. So what the angular power spectrum is trying to measure is how strong are the fluctuations on a given angular scale. To figure that out, you can take the map and you try to get, let's say you're interested in uh, the strength of the fluctuations on five degree scales. You will average out everything that's on smaller scales, and then you remove all the information on larger scales. You can do that by taking a map and smoothing it to somewhat uh, larger scales and taking the difference of the two. And then you get a map that looks like this. And I'll show you, so I'll do that for five degrees. Then I'll show you for, for different, uh, different angular scales. And I'll keep the, the color scale the same for all the maps. And then you will see that the signal at five degrees, this is what it looks like. So you see some light blue, you see some orange, but it looks pretty faint. As you go to one degree, uh, it looks a lot stronger. So you see that you have some dark blue, some dark red, and this was on the same color scale. So this means the fluctuations that you're seeing on one degree are much stronger than the fluctuations on five degrees. And you keep going with that exercise. You can go to, let's say, a half a degree. And you see that it's getting fainter uh, again. And you can keep going. You can measure it at many different uh, angular scales. You get a measurement like this. So on five degree scales, I showed you the map. And uh, you see that it was kind of faint. This was the light orange and light blue map. Then as you go to one degree, it was much brighter. That's obviously why I chose one degree to show you this feature. Then uh, if you go to 0.5 degree, it gets uh, fainter again. And then as you keep going, it gets fainter and fainter. Maybe because I show a few of these, maybe I'll briefly ask if there's questions about this so it makes sense what I'm showing here. What's the angular power spectrum? The angular power spectrum is this this figure. So this is just called the, the angular power you spectrum. Look at the cosmic background, and you've got yeah. a, your, 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 how much power is in a, in, a, in a certain size? Or yeah. So you would take the the map, get rid of all the information on smaller and larger scales than the scales you're interested in, so and look for how how strong the signal is there. How strong it is within five degrees. Uh, yeah, so you average everything on scales that are smaller than 5 degrees, and you do another map. We average on slightly larger than 5 degrees subtract. So the only information you have in the map is about 5 degrees. So this is taken from the Planck data? I did this from the Planck data. So I haven't actually seen it shown this way. I was trying to show these as an illustration. In practice, this is not how it's really measured. This is just an illustration that shows you visually what's going on. So you could measure the angular power spectrum this way, only keep uh, information on five degrees, make the measurement of the, the power spectrum here. I did that, I mean, I fought just for myself, for entertainment. But that's not how it's usually <laughs> It's not really how it's usually done. For their entertainment. For your entertainment as well, yeah, also mine, but <laughs> yeah? Is there a theory as to the shape of that final curve? Yeah. You can explain why it's that shape? Yeah, I'll say yes. So that's why we think we understand the, the early universe quite well, because we have a simple theory that explains it. That theory makes additional predictions that you can test. I'll, I'll show that in, a, in just a second. So, so what's special about one degree? Uh, so we'll also see that, but that is the, uh, what's telling you, the, basically that's measuring the position of this. So this is the, the peak 
here. Yeah. This is telling you essentially about the, the age of the universe, or how far the surface is away. I see. You couldn't know that a priori, so that's not something you can know. That's something you can extract from the data and then learn how old the universe is. So, so, that's the, so there's nothing intrinsically. Uh, so in fact, if you observe the, the CMB uh, some, some time from now, you would be looking further out, so the features would be smaller. So the CMB spectrum, if you were to measure it as a function of time, when we don't have... You know, you have to wait tens of thousands of years to, to see this effect, so we can't really do it in practice, but eventually it would get dimmer and shift out, so this is... If there were another universe somewhere, yeah. at, the same, at the same age as ours, would you get that same shape of curve? Uh, so that depends on the composition of that universe. If that other universe has the same density of atoms, same density of, of matter, then yes, you would get the, the yeah, same curve. <laughs> There's a priori no reason that, that if it's a completely different universe that it has the same composition. But if it had the same composition, you would expect to see the same same shape. So I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. Can you explain yeah. the secondary uh, peaks? The, these peaks? Yes. Uh, whether we understand them or whether I can explain them right now. <laughs> Choice. <laughs> My choice. Okay, so let me give you a bit. Of, I, I didn't include it, but I, I guess I should have maybe included more of the, the technical details. So let me try to say a little bit about the underlying physics that you're actually seeing here. So what you're seeing, so I, I don't have slides on this, but so let me just explain what the different peaks are. So uh, the, as we said, the, the universe is hot and dense. It's made of electrons and protons, photons. So there's a, a plasma that supports sound waves. So you can have density perturbations in that medium. And uh, you can think of it as a superposition of, of standing waves for a second. That's a good approximation for, for this picture. The different, uh, so the different scales we're looking at here then correspond to different wavelengths of the, the standing waves. And if you have uh, sound waves, they always, I mean, it's a basic, uh, it's based on symmetries. They have a dispersion relation that's linear. So if you have uh, longer sound waves, they will oscillate more slowly. Is it just resonant frequencies then? Uh, essentially, so you have frequencies. So they all start uh, oscillating with some amplitude. Then you have a set of uh, wavelengths that uh, have just the right wavelength to shift up to get to the, to the maximum by the time the universe becomes neutral. That's this wavelength that you're seeing here. Then as you go to somewhat shorter wavelengths, the modes oscillate a little bit faster, and so there's another set of uh, wavelengths where the mode makes it up and back down. You get, this is squared, so this is a power spectrum, this is squared, so this is, the second peak is the mode that uh, oscillates by two pi, or that makes one oscillation. Then you have another one that makes it uh, up, down, and up again. So that's the, the third peak and so on. And we've seen seven of these peaks. So we think that that's the, the correct, correct mm -hmm. physics. That's the, the basic physics. So what you're looking at are these kind of sound waves. The harmonics? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, the universe is expanding. Isn't that going to screw things up, the standing waves? Uh, so the universe becomes neutral for all of them at the same same time. So the universe becomes neutral pretty quickly uh, when it reaches a temperature of about 3,000 Kelvin, just because protons and electrons form hydrogen. And from then on, the photons just propagate to us. So the that's not entirely true. Eventually, you have star formation. There are some free electrons that scatter, and so this suppresses the power spectrum a little bit, but to a good approximation, they just free stream. Yeah? So uh, standing waves implies reflection? Reflection. So here, I think there's no, no reflection. I mean, so imagine a universe that's infinite. So you're imagining pinning them at the ends, and then you have... Oh, you're getting standing waves. Standing waves. Sorry? Why should you usually have reflection with standing waves? That's a good if you have boundaries, I guess. So here, here there's no boundaries. So just imagine an infinite universe for the, for the, for the second. You're traveling with it in that case. It's acoustic. It doesn't necessarily have to, to travel. So you can still write, uh, uh, decompose it in terms, of these, uh, in terms of these waves. Uh, okay, so 
I only really described it in very minimal detail, but so we have a theory that describes the, the medium. And so if you compare the theory to the data, it really allows us to measure the composition, the geometry, and age of the universe. And it turns out that the model that uh, fits the data is very simple. So all you need to know is that 5% of the energy density today is stored in atoms. 30% of the energy today is in matter. The universe is uh, flat, or flat to a very good approximation, and it's about 13.8 billion years old. So this is what follows from the, the peak positions. And this, I mean, here obviously there's more parameters that you have to know if you want to do all the calculations. Those we usually take from lab experiments. For example, the properties of hydrogen we take from lab experiments. We assume that there's three species of neutrinos. And this is something that, in principle, you can test, so you can independently constrain them from the data, and you find that it's 2.99 plus minus uh, 0.17. So that's consistent with what, you, what we know from the lab. And so here I'm just trying to give you a, a brief visual idea of which parts of the spectrum constrain what. So as I briefly explained, the peak position constrains the age of the universe and the curvature just because we know how far these sound waves really can travel from the beginning of uh, when the, the medium, the, the universe is first filled with this medium until the universe becomes neutral and then uh, from how big they look in the sky we know how far away it is, what the age is. Then from the magnitude here we can measure the matter density. The more matter there is, the deeper the gravitational potentials and so the, the larger the, the fluctuations. Here I'm just indicating the first and the second peak, but it's really the difference between the even and odd peaks that allows you to measure the density of atoms. And then the number of neutrinos you can measure from how fast the, the spectrum here uh, damps as you go to, to smaller scales. So you can really learn a lot about the composition of the medium at the time from looking at the, uh, at the power spectrum. So this is, uh, you might say, well, but maybe there's some other theory that also kind of fits uh, these. Maybe I can just fit a polynomial to it if you work hard <laughs> enough. Uh, how do we really know that uh, this is uh, what's going on? And the theory makes additional predictions that we can test. So for example, the, we expect the cosmic microwave background uh, to be polarized. So, um, and that's also something we can measure. So briefly, let me just say, you might all have, uh, might be familiar uh, with polarized sunglasses or how they're supposed to work. So the basic idea is that say the sun is somewhere up here, you're looking at a mountain, the light scatters uh, off the, the snow and uh, you see it. If you have unpolarized sunglasses or just no sunglasses, you will see a glare from, from the scattering. And uh, it turns out that if uh, that light is polarized uh, transverse to the direction, uh, to the plane in which the scattering occurs. So if it scatters like this, the light would be polarized in, in this direction. And so you can uh, take a polarization filter that only lets polarization through in, in this direction. This would completely block out the, the glare and you get a, a clearer picture. So that's the basic idea of the polarized sunglasses. And if you wanted to, you can also turn your sunglasses around and maximize the glare, if that's something you like. <laughs> this is essentially what we do for the cosmic microwave background. We try to find out in which direction is the glare or the polarization maximal. So we're measuring the polarization angle and the, the intensity. And so uh, briefly, why do we think it's, uh, it's polarized? So if you have a, a hot uh, medium, so this is, uh, let's say, the, the photon bath in the early universe, and you have some electrons here, if it's homogeneous, you have the same temperature everywhere, uh, you might say, that, okay, I have some photons that scatter this electron from this direction. It comes out, and we see it then uh, the scattering plane is this plane. It's polarized perpendicular to it, so we expect some polarization for that scattering event. But there's the same number of photons that come from, from this direction, and so the net effect is that the radiation uh, for a homogeneous medium is expected to be zero. This changes if you have a, a quadrupole, so you have some hotter region and a, a colder region and a hotter region, because in that case you get more photons from the right that scatter of the electron and lead to a polarization, uh, a vertical polarization, then you have uh, photons that scatter from the colder region and uh, lead to the horizontal polarization. And so you get a net polarization that's vertical in, uh, in this. So if you have a temperature quadrupole, 
Uh, and we saw that there's temperature fluctuations. I should really motivate why there's a quadrupole, which I'm not going to do, but I'm happy to explain if people want to understand uh, better afterwards. But if there's a quadrupole, you expect uh, net polarization of the cosmic microwave background, and this is something we can look for. And in particular, you can, in the model, you can calculate what that should look like. And what it should look like, according to the model, is the red curve. Uh, this is the model just based on the temperature data I showed you before. And then you plot the data on it. This data is not fit to the, to the red curve. The red curve is the prediction. And you see that you got the physics uh, correct. I mean, this, it would be a coincidence. So if you just fit the temperature data with your polynomial, then I'm pretty sure this, uh, this part won't come out OK. So that's the uh, way you can predict. The other way we can be sure there's a lot of uh, physics in here that if anyone is interested in more detail, I can explain the, the features here more. But the basic upshot here was just that the, the theory really predicts this and is in good agreement with what we see. Another thing is you could ask, well, does it predict the late universe, the simple model? If you run it forward in time, does it look like our universe at late times? And it turns out that if you do this exercise, uh, it does really form the kind of filamentary structure that we see in galaxy redshift surveys. So everything that we know uh, seems consistent with the exception of this uh, small tension in the, in the Hubble parameter, where right now the value that's predicted by the cosmic microwave background measurements is somewhat lower than the value that's inferred from the, the local Hubble measurements. So that's a, a tension or difference that's interesting, but overall I think the zeroth order picture is that this uh, basic cosmology describes our universe remarkably well with just a few, a few parameters. Now, the, uh, these are the kind of quantitative things where you can use it to measure the matter density, uh, density of atoms. There's also some qualitative things that we learn about it that are perhaps even more fascinating. One of them, or oh, this is usually referred to as the horizon problem. So here this is supposed to be the satellite that measures the cosmic microwave background. This is our map. And you see that the temperature is 2.7255, so this is the last measurement from, from Kobe, 2.7255 Kelvin everywhere in the sky. So you would think that somehow there must have been some communication. Otherwise, it's unclear why the universe should have the same temperature in all directions in the sky. So this is a comic I came across that looked somewhat related to me. So. Uh, yeah, so if you ask, see everyone asking for 43 cents, presumably they must have uh, known of each other. So that's the basic <laughs> idea here for the horizon problem. And in the model we have, you can ask whether the two, the different regions in the sky actually had a way to communicate with each other. And it turns out, according to the model that I just presented to you, they really didn't have a chance to communicate. The universe just isn't old enough. So uh, according to our little model, we shouldn't expect the cosmic microwave background to look this homogeneous. We should expect uh, much larger fluctuations. That's the first puzzle. This puzzle kind of gets worse because you can also look at the, uh, the temperature uh, and isotropies. And here I was describing for you the, um, uh, the sound waves and the, the phases. And it turns out that the, the spectrum we're looking at it tells us that for whatever reason, the phases of the oscillations in this part of the sky are the same as the phases in this part of the sky. So it's not just the temperature, but they're also all oscillating with the, with the same phase. And that also suggests that some process must have set up the, the phases so they really are the same uh, in all directions. If that wasn't the case, if you had uh, local processes, then again you would expect different phases in a spectrum that looks very different. So it shouldn't have the nice peak structure that we saw. Uh, you can go further and uh, look at the polarization measurements. Uh, if, if anyone is really interested, because some of you uh, had uh, quite technical questions, so if, if anyone is more interested I can describe uh, this in more detail later, but the, the polarization measurements provide additional evidence for this, uh, for this phase coherence. And at least in the context of Einstein's general relativity, this requires uh, uh, the, the fact or the way to, the only way to really get these uh, different parts or to set up these kind of uh, perturbations in a causal way in general relativity is either through accelerated expansion, which is usually called inflation, or through a, a decelerated contracting phase of the universe. We know that this is not the phase we live in. So in this phase, 
you have to somehow bounce and make it out on the other side into a universe that's expanding. So these are the two basic options. The one uh, that's ex uh, expanding is really the one that's uh, predominantly studied, but those are the two basic options. And here the idea is uh, that the early universe underwent a period of nearly exponential expansion where during the first 10 to the minus 33 seconds, it expanded by 30 orders of magnitude. So a tremendous expansion. And then uh, it's easy to see that if you have a small patch initially, it gets blown to, to a huge size. And really, we see the same uh, temperature everywhere in the sky because it came from one in the same uh, little region early on. So that's how it would explain the, uh, the temperature uh, perturbations. Um, in addition, if you have such a period, so where you have a nearly exp uh, exponential expansion, we know that we don't live in that period, so the universe has to have some clock. It has to know how to end this period. And according to quantum mechanics, so I'm not really deriving any of these, but uh, according to quantum mechanics, there should be small fluctuations in this clock, which means that the universe would end this expansion slightly earlier in some parts and slightly later in other parts. And so you get small ripples uh, in, in this, and the idea is that the fluctuations we see here are really the result of these uh, quantum uh, fluctuations in the, the clock that's telling the universe when to end inflation. And this is why I was calling the, the talk our quantum universe, because the idea is that the quantum fluctu fluctuations here get, uh, are the source for the fluctuations we see in the cosmic microwave background. They get processed through the the plasma physics that I briefly described, and then eventually from these tiny fluctuations, the stars and galaxies we see around us grow, all of it from the, the quantum fluctuations in this, in this clock. Um, and uh, so you might say, well, there might be, as I said, there's uh, potentially other theories that could explain this. There's open questions in inflation. We don't fully understand how it, uh, how it began. This is something we've been uh, spending a fair amount of time on, uh, as Mark said, in, in the context. I mean, we've been working on this, um, this modern uh, inflation collaboration. So in that context, we've been thinking about how inflation uh, might have gotten, uh, gotten started, for example. Uh, but the one thing I think everyone agrees is that inflation, in addition to the fluctuations in the clock, also predicts quantum fluctuations in space-time itself. So there should be small ripples in, in space-time and they lead to a very characteristic polarization pattern in the cosmic microwave background that one can also look for. It's not something that, that you would confuse with the things we've seen before, although you might confuse it with uh, dust from the Milky Way. So there's that problem. <laughs> uh, but in principle, if you measure it at multiple frequencies, it has a different frequency dependence. So here I'm showing you everything in one uh, figure because I'm showing you just also how far the measurements have come. So remember that the CMB temperature is 2 Kelvin or 2.7255 Kelvin. These fluctuations were the 18 micro Kelvin uh, that we were seeing. These are up here. By now, we've gone uh, orders of magnitude below and mapped part of the, the emote spectrum, not yet the, the small tail. And we're trying to get down to these uh, gravitational waves. Here are the most recent measurements for this or upper limits on this. And so people have really pushed the sensitivity of the experiments uh, way down. The goal is to get to nano Kelvin. So from Kelvin, where initially the CMB was detected, down to nano Kelvin. So this is the next uh, set of experiments. Here is the current, essentially the largest signal that's currently allowed. This already uh, ruled out uh, some models. But really, the search is just getting started. And over the next decade or so, uh, we'll try to push the, the measurements down to about the level that I'm showing here with uh, uh, several experiments. So here are the experiments that are taking data right now. Uh, this is uh, the bicep keck was the collaboration that reported the measurement that turned out to be essentially dust, uh, SPT. Mm -hmm. Then polar bear, you might uh, gather that this presumably was not always meant to be in the Atacama Desert, but so here you have polar bear in the Atacama Desert. And then there's uh, advanced act class. Several experiments are taking data right now. Some of these are already done. And then as we go forward, relatively soon, there should be uh, Simon's Observatory. Uh, it was initially started relatively small. By now, there's a long list of, uh, of groups that are working on it. This is not showing the, the experiment. This is just showing the site where it will be. This is the ACT. This is the um, uh, polar bear uh, Simons array. And this is the CMB 
uh, S4 if you go further. So this is an experiment where essentially the entire CMB community in the US will join uh, and operate from two sites. One is in, in Chile, one, uh, in Chile in the Atacama Desert, the other one is at the South Pole. And there's also an experiment that was recently selected by JAXA in Japan. Uh, it's called Lightbird. And these uh, experiments will push the limits down to essentially what I was showing. The launch should be in, in 2028. So over the next uh, decade or so, we'll really learn uh, a lot about the uh, inflationary part. But of course, they will also really tell us a lot more about uh, other aspects of the, of the universe. For example, they will measure the content age that we already discussed to even higher precision. And here in this picture that I like, you also see that you can map the matter density in this way because the photons from the cosmic microwave background to reach us have to make their way through stars and galaxies. They're slightly deflected. And this effect has been detected at high significance. So you can actually make maps of the matter along the line of sight from this. You can also map the hot gas in galaxies from this just because the photons interact with the hot gas. Uh, they get heated a little bit. It causes a spectral distortion away from the nice black body that I was showing earlier that can be detected. It constrains particles beyond the standard model. So there's really a lot that we're hoping uh, to learn from these experiments. What we're not really going to learn about from the experiments all that much is the kind of thing we've been, we were thinking about during the, the program here that was called From Inflation to the Hot Big Bang. So here the question was, how inflation ends and how the universe becomes filled with the, the hot and dense plasma. Um, and uh, that's something that we've been uh, thinking about. It's less clear how you experimentally test this area, but still interesting to, to think about, speculate about exactly how that should work and see if you can actually think of some experimental consequences of it. Um, so just to conclude, uh, I, as I explained, so we're looking out into the universe really allows us to look back in time. So essentially, by taking more and more data to higher redshift, we really see how the universe evolved. Because we're looking back in time, the earliest light we can see, as I also mentioned, because eventually the universe is ionized, uh, the earliest light we can see is radiation that's left over directly from the hot early universe. And this radiation is the cosmic microwave background that I described. The observations this really constrain uh, the composition, age, geometry of the universe uh, to good precision. Right now, to about a percent, we'll uh, do significantly better with the upcoming uh, experiments. And as far as we know, they really reveal that the universe is very simple. So it only takes a few parameters to describe uh, what we see out there. And um, uh, we also saw, or I briefly argued for you, that the properties that we see in the CMB, the fact that it's so homogeneous, 2.7255 Kelvin over the full sky, and that the phases of the uh, oscillations are the same everywhere in the sky, really means that there has to have been some earlier period that generated these uh, perturbations. In principle, this might have, if it's inflation, you would expect that it generated some level of uh, space-time fluctuations as well that one can look for in the cosmic microwave background, and that's something we're currently actively working on. And so if you have questions about any of the experiments, you can, you can ask me more about it. And hopefully, with the help of these experiments, we'll uh, learn a lot more about the first fractions of our universe and also the, the later parts. So okay. that's Thank you. It seems to me, the description of the CMB, it seems like it's, it's, a, it's an absolute frame of reference. Yeah, it does provide a, a frame of reference. An absolute frame of reference. How's that, how's that mesh with special relativity? Uh, in special relativity, you usually assume that there really isn't anything in the, in the space time, and then there's no preferred frame. But as soon as you have a medium, if you have a fluid or some other medium, you have a frame because there's a special frame where you see the same number of photons going this way as you see going that way over the same velocities. As soon as you have a medium, there's a preferred frame. So in some sense, there is an ether. Right? <laughs> it's the cosmic microwave yeah. background. So, so when you talk about, oh, I'm sorry. When uh, the uh, gravitational waves are detected, there was the speculation that this would be a great insight into the pre, pre earliest times before the yeah. threshold. Yeah. Has that happened? 
No, it, it didn't happen. <laughs> so, so, unfortunately, that hasn't happened. So if you detect this signal, then you really learn something about the period of inflation that I described. No, it hasn't happened because the measurement at the time really turned out to be just a measurement of dust. So it's not, we didn't see the signal, unfortunately. So have, have there been any considerations of perhaps using magnetic uh, lenses to understand what's happening in the ionized area? So in other words, you know, uh, clearly if you have magnetic fields, you can take a look at structure, and that's what people do in the, uh, in the uh, fusion activity uh -huh. using, you know, tokamaks and whatnot. So if everything is ionized, you would think that magnetic fields could be utilized to try to understand the structure of the ions. Yeah, so we do that at some level at a later time. So the kind of work we, we've been doing on understanding the interstellar medium, understanding how the dust grains emit and, and so on, right. in, in that part uh, we use uh, magnetic fields because the, the dust grains trace the magnetic field line. So you use techniques like this at later times, not really for the, for the early time. We don't you think. From trying to understand the structure by looking at the uh, uh, magnetic manifolds and things of that nature? Uh, so we don't really think that there are large scale magnetic fields present at, at that time. And then the other magnetic fields, so the short, uh, yep. high frequency ones that we see, are just the photons that we're actually observing. Okay. So that's the okay. information right. that we're trying to use. The other ones would be large scale magnetic fields that don't really seem to be present. Good.